at Tunnel Barn Farm today on a freezing, freezing, freezing January day. And we've come to do something a little bit different. We've come to fish a feeder on a snake lake just for, just for something different more than anything. I've recently, I've been sick of ooh, fishing in really, really windy conditions at venues that are sort of like 15, 16 metres wide. And it's been a nightmare, do you know what I mean? It's really, really hard. And I think in a lot of cases, we're too stubborn that we have to fish that pole no matter what. Because it's a snake lake, everyone thinks you've got to fish a pole and go to that far bank. So today I want to have a little play and just prove that you don't. Definitely for me recently, um, better presentation has been more important than really girly presentation that I can get on the pole. So definitely what I'm going to go through today is just a few little tricks that I've, I've sort of learned over the last few weeks fishing a feeder and definitely the, the benefits it's given me and I'm definitely putting a few more fish in the net as a result of it. So I'm going to stick this one in the net and then we'll go through things. Right, well first things first, before I get on to the, the sexy technical bit, I just want to go through basic kit. I mean, mega, mega simple for this sort of style, that there's no reason you can't use the kit that you're using for your conventional feeder fishing, as long as it's nicely refined and, I mean, you, you don't want a 13 foot feeder rod or nothing like that, but something nice that's really soft, that's not too long, because you're only chucking a short distance, but there's other things that you can do to combat that with your casting. Uh, and a nice, nice little diddy reel as well. So for me, I've got a little tiny 10 foot feeder, which is mega, mega soft which is perfect for fishing for the smaller fish that I'm going to be targeting in the winter. I mean, there's not a, a great big chance of catching numbers of carp. I may have gone add one, but it's predominantly going to be skimmers and F1s that I'm going to be catching at this sort of venue in the way that I'm fishing. So I want a really, really soft rod that's not going to prevent me bouncing my feeder out because I'm fishing a little in line, fairly heavy feeder for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. I don't want that to bounce out the fish's mouth. So a nice little 10 foot, a little 10 foot feeder that's really, really soft and not gonna pull the hook out of them fish. Nice little 3,000 reel that does the job so it's not overbalancing things. And lastly, I've got some five pound mono one, which I'll talk about again in a minute, which is really important. So on these, these smaller venues that, what I'm talking about today is quite specific for the, the weather you wanna fish it in. You wanna fish it in either bad weather because you can't fish a pro properly or because it's just slightly too long for the pole you've got. Maybe it's 16, 17 meters it's a bit too long then you might use a feeder for them reasons but for me it's bad weather that i always want to go to just to create a, a better form of presentation where i, I couldn't with the pole because of the conditions so what i'm going to do i'll talk about my little feeders next for today we're just going to fish a little tiny flatbed feeder that's just going to sit on that slope lovely something else i'm going to talk about in a minute and we're just going to feed some pellets and try and keep that peg on as long as we possibly can i'm going to go through now just how i load my feeder and the little things i do to make my feeder just right Right, so like I just mentioned, today I've gone with a Pella feeder approach. That's going to be me in 90% of the time. That's my go-to approach on this style of venue, mainly because of the slope that I'm going to be fishing on. So there might be an odd occasion I might chuck a bomb, if I chuck a little square bomb that's going to sit on the bottom. But for me, most of the time it's going to be a pellet feeder, simply because this is going to give me the best possible presentation uh, through fishing on an incline. It's pretty much the only feeder that's going to go in and stick where I want it to fish, because these venues are notoriously steep, or well, most cases they are when you throw it towards that far bank. So I need something that sits properly. So by having a nice open case feeder in that case, no matter where I chuck that on the slope and how steep the gradient is, within reason as long as it's not ridiculous, it's still gonna present my bait properly. I'm still gonna have a nice pile of bait that the fish can come down and feed on, as opposed to if I were to use a sort of a conventional pellet feeder, where it'd be sat up and the bait wouldn't um, expel from it correctly. So a nice flat feeder, for me, that does the job. Coincidentally, it is also the feeder that I found that you introduce the minimal amount of bait with. That there's no other feeder other than maybe a little two square cage feeder that I've ever used that I can feed so little bait, which is exactly what I want. So the more bait I feed, the quicker I'm gonna knacker the peg and the quicker they're gonna move off. Do you know what I mean? At the end of the day, it's January, it's freezing. That the last thing they wanna do is feed. And if I'm completely honest, this is probably a method I don't want to employ. It's something I wanna do through necessity, either through not being able to get over there or the weather just being too bad. So, so I've got my little feeder, in this case, a nice little running feeder. I'd pretty much use that everywhere I go. 
I don't tend to uh, like elasticated version, so I'll go with a nice little inline. I've got a little bead and I've got my hook line tied directly onto that bead. I don't like um, having a loop at the bottom. So it's just a personal thing for me that I find that by having it tied directly to my loop, uh, directly to my bead, instead of having a, a loop that can pivot, I find that it increases the bolt effect just a little bit more because as soon as the fish pulls on it, it's not got that loop to rotate. It's just straight onto a knot. So it helps put that fish in the uh, hook in the fish's mouth a little bit quicker. So for me, that's always me my choice of attaching my hook length. It can be a bit fiddly changing your hook lengths. You've got to put a new one on, but it's the way it is. I, I find that, that um, there's more benefits to that than having a loop on. And today's case, I've got a little diddy hook length. I've probably got a two and a half inch hook length there of 012 or 012.5. It'll 0.125 line it is the hook length, which is nice and light, say for both for me getting more bites. I'm a big believer in fishing as light as possible, but also I'm, I'm a massive believer when fishing a pellet feeder or a method feeder in that the lighter line you can get away with, it, it's not so much for getting you more bites, it just becomes far more sut, uh, sut, sut, what's the word? Subtle. No, not more subtle, supple. So, <laughs> nearly, right? But yeah, it's far more supple, so it bends back over into the feeder better. Because the last thing I want is once my bait becomes released because my pellets are broke down, for my heavy hook line to, because there's a bit of stiffness in, in heavier monofilament, for it to ping out my, my actual feeder. So the lighter hook length I can actually use, and in this case I can get away with it because the fish is so small, the better it's going to hold my pellets in place over that feeder. It's not going to ping it out my feeder as soon as my pellets broke down. So for today, that's what we're going to go with. I've got a little ditty size 20 hook on there, little tiny uh, eye duck. That's a medium gauge wire as well, which is quite important for me. Because I'm fishing it on a rod, I've got to fish something a little bit heavier than what I'd use on a pole, just because of the pressure I'm going to apply to it. I need to be able to give it a bit more poke and be able to get them out of it quicker. So that's pretty much my setup, good to go. What I'm going to go through next is talk about my bait a little bit and just how I put a pellet on and more importantly, how I load the feeder to make sure I get some bites. Right, so before I load my feeder, I want to warm myself up a bit because it is flipping freezing, but also I want to talk about my bait. Yeah, something I've really got to think about in the winter. It can't just be a case of cracking open a bag of micro pellets, soaking them and, and then working like I would in the summer. I've definitely got to think about it a little bit more just to try and like prolong the life of my peg, try and feed baits uh, in smaller amounts firstly, that my feeder's going to do that for me by using a little tiny feeder, but secondly to use baits that are going to uh, disperse quicker, they're, they're going to break down, they're going to disappear, they're not going to fill the fish up. So what I've gone for, something I wouldn't do in the summer, is I've gone for a lot of ground bait in today's mix. I've decided to use pretty much just a crushed expander ground bait, mainly because it, it's ground so fine, the stuff that I use, in that when it goes into the water, it disperses almost instantly. I mean, obviously it'll get down to the bottom on my feeder and it'll be held into place, but as soon as I've either, a fish has had a go at it, a fish has upset the feeder, or I've hooked a fish, then all that ground weight, look, it'll just disappear to nothing. Because the particles in it are so small, it, it won't carry on feeding the fish in my peg. It'll disappear and I'll be able to have almost a clean peg every time I go in. What I have done, I've just added a few micro pellets to my mix. So I've still got plenty of micros there in case the fishing gets really good. But I've added just a few to it, just to give them a little bit of bait to feed. So you never know, it could be good. We've had a little chuck and there's a few fish feeding. So I can get away with introducing a tiny bit. But if I were to just introduce micros on their own, like even a small feeder's full, that would probably be nearly a feeder's foot worth. It's a lot of bait. 
I mean, it's what I'm trying to do is think about if I was fishing my pole over there, how would I feed it? And I need to emulate that as closely as I possibly can with a feeder, which is what I'm trying to do. So I say for today's mix, what I've gone with, I've probably gone with about 10% micros and 90% ground bait. And that's going to give me a lovely mix. It's going to break down really, really, really quickly uh, once it hits the bottom, plus it's going to disappear. So it's going to allow me to fish certain spots for longer without putting too much bait into those spots and, and create sort of a dangerous spot, uh, area for the fish to be in, which we don't want to do. So what I'll show you next is something I found really, really important. This is something that's come from uh, through the summer fishing, through a couple of people I've learnt off, and mainly through carp lads. It was actually watching some of Teddy Ayn's videos that got me thinking so much about uh, the hooking of fish, how you, where your hook actually ends up in fish's lips and how you hook them and what benefits your rigs or how your rig helps to hook the fish in the correct places. And so when my pellet feeder fishing and method feeder fishing, that's where it's definitely come to the fore, is, is loading it correctly to make things work. So what I've got today, I've got a little tiny band on. And what I'm gonna band on is a little tiny four mil pellet. And if you have a look at that, when my pellet's on, it's actually, it's like a little T. So the way it sits, my band actually sits, it's my pellet sits one way and my hook sits the other. So it's gonna sit really nicely when it lands on top of my method feeder. And I'm gonna put a little tiny base of ground weight on, a tiny, tiny little pinch, and that's enough to pretty much fill my feeder. And that's my base that my hook's gonna sit on lovely so we're going to stick him on top and what i want to do is have it so my hook is facing upwards so because i've got a little tiny two inch hook length on if i have my hook facing upwards on the feeder as soon as it goes in it's going to go right into the middle of the fish's mouth which is the best possible place i can hook it to make sure i get every fish out just because it gives you a better hold so you can pull a lot harder and there's less chance of losing fish when it's hooked in the bottom makes them easier to land as well they tend to pop the reds up a little bit so i've got my hook there sat right on top of the feeder with my pellet just bedded into the pellet at a right angle sort of how i'm looking and my hook's facing down this way and then i can just cover it really really lightly with a bit of that ground bait give it a press and i know if i actually look my hook sat still there right on the top so it's the best form of presentation i can possibly get with a little feeder the top bit's going to break down and my hook bait's just going to be sat there waiting to be sucked in and it's going to be straight into the fish's mouth which definitely for me it makes me believe that i'm putting more fish or i'm, I'm getting more bites uh, i'm seeing more bites and the fish aren't having the opportunity to have my bait spit it out without me seeing what's going on most of the time what percentage who knows till we can look at what's going on under the water not a clue, but I definitely feel I'm getting more percentage of fish hooking themselves as a result of just taking a bit more time to load my feeder correctly, making sure my hook's in the correct position in the first place. So with that done, time to chuck in see if we can catch a few. Right, so I've got all my bait sorted. What I want to think about now is where I want to cast it and how I want to cast it, which is the first thing I want to talk about. Because in this case, we're chucking, what, 15, 16 metres at the most. So the last thing I want to do, especially with a 10-foot rod, but even with a 9 or even an 8-foot rod, it's now only possible to over -arm, overhead cast, if you like, to cast conventionally and to get it to land nice, just simply because it's traveling down on a downwards trajectory if you were to cast overhead. So instead, by pinging it underarm, which is something that's definitely worth practicing if you want to do this uh, method regular, you can keep it a much flatter cast, which makes my feeder land much nicer on the water, which is so important with, with all your method feeder or pellet feeder fishing, is how your pellet lands, or how your feeder lands rather. So what I'm going to do, I've just clipped up for today's fishing, I've clipped off directly in front of me, touching the far bank. Because what that's going to give me, it's going to give me options to move about within one clip. So what I'm actually going to do, after having a little sneaky fish, we found that the fish is just down the slope, just in line with a tree that I've got me marked with, just towards the slightly deeper water. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to have my rod set, and what, two foot above me reel, my feeder. And what that allows me to do is really bend my rod. I'm going to take a little bit more off, in fact. I'm going to go three foot above my feeder. It's really bend my rod and flick it towards where I want to go. You can see that that makes my cast actually rise. So when I hit my clip, it can fall in nice. Whereas if I were casting the other way, it'd be, let's say, on a downward trajectory and it'd land in the water quite nastily. So by that nice little pingy underarm cast, it just lets me put that feeder in the water in a much nicer fashion, which will both look after me pellets that are on the feeder, but also make it land nicer. So I'm both, I'm not spoiling the pellets and I'm not upsetting any fish that are in the area. So with all that, that's done, ready to go, sitting, waiting for a bite. I'll talk about that in a sec. So as I said, what I've done, I've clipped up right in front of me, touching the mud. So on a, on a conventional snake lake, what you're generally going to find is, is that shelf runs parallel all the way in front of you. So by clipping up in front of me, what, what options it gives me is that I can fish in a multiple depth of water just by staying on the same clip, but changing the angle that I fish to. 
So as I say, right in front of me, I'm right on the far bank, which in this case is probably, it's a bit deeper over here, if, if memory serves me correctly, it's probably about three foot touching that far bank. It's quite a deep area this. But what I can do by going left or right on, on, uh, on that slope, I can actually move down the slope and fish different depths of water, but still remaining clipped up at the same point. So just as I would on the pole where I'd have rigs to cover different depths along that slope, my feeder, it's all done for me just by having that clip set and I can just keep chucking and chucking and chucking and find what depth, also by feeling it hit the bottom, seeing how long it takes to get to the bottom by holding it tight, I can work out what depth I'm feeding in or what depth I'm fishing in uh, to see if that's the, the depth the fish want to be. And obviously I've got things to look for, I've got lots of liners to look for, whether I'm catching fish or not or whether nothing's happening. That's going to give me a great indicator of whether I'm in the right depth or not. So what I'm going to try and do, I find that with F1s and, and little skimmers and whatever else that we're fishing for, that quick, quick casts are pretty much the order of the day. I found that if I leave it anything in excess of five minutes, it, it tends to become a little bit ineffective, probably because I'm fishing on that slope. And my bait's probably getting wafted away, the fish are upsetting it, and I'm just unlikely to get a bite after that time with such small fish, which is the complete opposite to if I was fishing for, for great big carp. Right. <laughs> it's been right good, if I'm honest. I, I've been really surprised today. I think I've got a prop on in here as well. And how well this has gone. If I'm completely honest, I really thought, even if I'd have got to fish the pole today in perfect conditions, I really do think, I, I, oh, I felt this morning when we arrived, it would have been a struggle. But it's amazed me just having this little, we've only been here for three hours, just having a quick session on this feeder, at just how versatile it is and how, how quickly I can, I can cover my peg. So it's been amazing chucking about and how quickly I can find where the fish are. Whereas with a pole, I tend to be very, I'm quite slow to move me. I'm, I'm always worried about moving too quick and scaring the fish out my peg. It's been completely opposite of that today. It's been great chucking about, finding a gang of fish, catching a little run and then losing them and finding them somewhere else. The, the versatility of this little feeder approach is proper amazed me. It's something I'm going to do a lot more. So definitely, I'm going to put this one in the net. I definitely recommend have a little go. It, it's amazed me. At them Snake Lake venues, it doesn't have to be that single-minded pole approach that we all seem to employ these days. There's definitely a big window there for us all. Just always bend the rules a little bit, do something a little bit different, and, and you might have a seriously good day as a result.